Hey there, it's the CHGO Fire Podcast presented by PointsBet. Use promo code CHGO when you sign up to get two risk-free bets up to $2,000. I'm Pat McCraney. He's Alex Campbell. And this is going to be kind of a sad show, I think. Yeah, uh, this it's, it's been very, um, we kind of, we were low. We declared the fire dead. Then they made us look very stupid. And were we just playing the long game? Because with that loss to NYCFC in Bridgeview over the weekend, it feels like the fire are kind of toast. It wasn't that they lost. It was how they lost. It was how they lost. And that's the thing. Like, sometimes a good team will make you look bad. I don't think NYCFC at this stage is particularly great. They were kind of limping into that game with, I think, four straight without a win. They had just lost to Charlotte midweek. And they were content to kind of sit back and defend. And the fire came out with nothing. Nothing. They, nothing. Like, like <laughs> and, you know, you, you have to wonder how, with so much to play for, with a very real chance at making the postseason, with three points a must because you're at home and you, you, you're going to go get them on the road, really? Like, you've got to get those three points at home. How they didn't have... They had no sense of urgency as a team. There were individual players that did, but as a team, there was no sense of urgency. They deserved to lose. They deserved what happened to them. Um, and, you know, you can understand once you're down 2-0, once you're down 3-0, if, you know, heads start to drop, shoulders start to sulk, whatever. But from the first minute of this game, they did not look like they were up for it. They did not look interested. They'd had a full week off, again, unlike NYCFC, yep. who lost 3-1 to Charlotte. Not a very good team, although they might make the playoffs anyway because the Eastern Conference is slowly going from a, you know, a conference of, wow, look at all these decent playing teams who might make the playoffs to, ooh, who's going to be left standing at the end of this? Um, but, yeah, no, NYC, you know, they took what the fire gave them early. The fire were willing to just let them have the ball, which I don't think was the worst strategy given that you don't exactly know what you're going to get from NYC these days. They're still trying to figure out exactly – how life without Tati Castellanos looks, yeah. how they're going to work. They started with Talos Magno playing in that central forward role. He kind of was rotating with Tiago a bit and who was playing. But the fire were passengers in this game. And, I mean, I don't know how quickly we want to get into this, Pat, but I think that's a pretty good segue into the first goal. I was going to say, that's which exactly. The, the fire started this game by just not only seeding possession, which is one thing. It is one thing to seed possession. It is one thing to then just watch the other team pass the ball around and do absolutely yeah, and when the nothing fire, when about the, it. When the fire did have the ball, NYCFC was sitting kind of low. The fire couldn't. There, they, like, there, there was no inspiration, no... Uh, we, they yeah, hit, they'd try that. to hit a switch and it would go out of bounds. It was... It was but the, let's talk about... Because I'm going to get really annoyed here. <laughs> uh, let's talk about that first goal. So... Uh, Pereira scores what is a goal of the year candidate. It's goal just a into the banger. Upper 90. I was sitting directly behind it, and when he takes that touch to put it to get it out of his feet, yeah. I'm like, ooh, that top corner's there for the tanking, the, and bang. The initial reaction everybody had was, well, that's almost impossible to defend. But then you look at the buildup to that, and that's when you start to get upset because what happens in the buildup to it is the double pivot. Both shifts, for some reason, Fede and Pineda, both shifts out to what would be the New York's left side, the Fire's right side. I believe it's Tiago who's yeah, on the ball. To defend the, the ball, right? The pass comes in. Pereira makes his run right over Shaq's shoulder, and Shakiri stands there and does absolutely nothing. Not even the lightest jog, not even the not even pretending to play defense. He stands there, watches Pereira run into space, hit the banger. Chris Mueller comes flying in from the other side way too late. Sekulich tries to step. Also too late. Too Navarro late, realizes but, he's out of position. Yeah. Sek Sekulich tries to step, but in Sekulich's defense, I don't know why the pivot went over and, and took his both area. Of them. Yeah, because both of them went, and I like yeah. Sekulich almost has to come back around then and take their spot. So... I don't know how hard I want to be on him, but I do want to be hard on Shaq because somebody said on, on, on Twitter, well, it's not his job to play defense. I guess that's true. But I wrote this on CHGO. What would we have done? What would Klopp have done if he had pulled that stunt at Liverpool? Subbed him off within yeah. 90 seconds? Yeah. 
and he wouldn't have played for a while. But here he gets away with it because he's the man and he has to be out there and he's, you know, he's paid to create so he can watch guys run by him. I asked him in the locker room, I, I, straight up, I'm like, what, hap- what, what went on in that first goal? He goes, oh, it was a beautiful goal. There's not much we could do. And I'm like, how did he get in so much space? I specifically asked Shakiri, how did Pereira get in so much space? And he's like, well, it's simple. We, we could have defended better as a, as a team. Not we. Sure we, but take that ownership there, Shaq. That's on you to set an example. Every once in a while, for $8.15 million, you should play a little defense. Yeah, so yeah, what happens there, as you mentioned, the double pivot both goes out right. So there's just this vacuum of space in Gigantic front of the back four. Gigantic amount of space. So it's just, it's Shakiri letting the right, even if Shakiri follows him, there's probably a chance coming here. It's not as easy a chance. But yeah, you get both Pineda and Navarro go wide in. To your point, you get Mueller, Fetty Navarro, and Sekulich all realize the problem. They, yeah. they all turn, as soon as Pereira has the ball, they're all like, oh shit, this is bad. Yeah. And yeah. it's way too late. Gaga can't get anywhere near this ball. Yeah, nothing he could have done. Nothing Gaga can do it was about it. perfectly placed. And then, so, after that, you're hoping, are we going to see a response? And kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, the fire do not do well against low blocks. And NYC were already kind of leaning low block and then, to start. And once yeah. they were in the lead, it was like, yeah. oh, well, I guess we're really just going to lean into this now. The fire struggle against teams who sit in that low block and make them try to break them down with passing. You look at the, the fire look best in a game like the Charlotte game where it's very transitional yeah. and you can get the likes of Torres and Mueller out into space yeah. and the likes of Fetty Navarro can press and just have a lot of runway. But when the game slows down, this group struggle to create. And we saw that I think most notably maybe with Jairo Torres who does not oh. seem at all to suit the game state the Fire so often find themselves in in the attack. And I talked about this after the Atlanta game more broadly, that the Fire tend to get stuck sometimes in this kind of half-court offense where they're trying to play these very intricate balls into these minimal amounts of spaces, and it just doesn't work. It particularly does not work for Torres, who seems to be most useful operating in straight lines, both with and without the ball. He's either a guy you want making straight line runs in behind or with the ball at his feet running at a defender or off the ball, you want him using, you know, taking space, closing down space. But instead, you kind of get like almost a copy of what Shakiri's doing with him just kind of walking a lot because there is no space. And instead of trying to create any, he just kind of stands he there. He actually did and doesn't the do anything. opposite at one point in the second half. He, he took away space from Mauricio Pineda is he's got the ball. And he's working his way into space down the right side. And if Torres either goes forward or moves to the side, Pineda could have kept going. But he doesn't do either. In fact, he stops with his back turned right in front of Pineda. Pineda basically drives the ball right into him with no options then. It's clogged and they lose the ball. Are you disinterested in being here? Do you not want to win? Like I, 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 I literally felt that, like, like we talked about, there were individual guys like Gaga who you could tell wanted to win that game. Gaga was amping the crowd up and waving yeah. down three nil. I yeah. mean, like, and we'll get to this Two more. Nil, but we'll get to this yeah. more in a second. That kid cares. Yeah, the eighteen-year-old who technically no longer even plays for the club is the. I mean, I'm sure we know from experience there are other people in that locker room who do care, but in terms of playing. Like they care. Gaga made three phenomenal saves in this game. This game could have been four, five, six nil easily. The fact that the 18 year old who is checking out of here physically in a couple of months, technically not even registered to the fire anymore, yeah, paperwork wise, the fact that he's the only guy who looks like he gives a damn, that is so indicting of the entire team. I, I think there's a handful of others individually that, that, you know, that give a damn, but yeah. As a whole, I I don't know what that was. I, I just am I'm baffled by the fact, and I said this at the beginning of the show, that you can come in with so much to play for. The, the, the table is so tight that you three points, because every game's almost almost every game's a six pointer at this point. Maybe not with NYCFC, but with plenty of others. You can move from 12th to 5th to 5th to 12th. It's, it's moving all around. It's going to be a jumble until the final day of the season, 
and you know it's looking like the Fire aren't going to have to worry about Decision Day on the trajectory they're currently on. But Decision Day in the Eastern Conference is going to be nuts. Yeah, it, it's so looking at it right now, you've got the Fire still on thirty points, right? And so, Atlanta's the only other team there. DC's a lost cause. DC's gone. And you don't even see Miami on there anymore because they're playing so well, they're suddenly ahead of Columbus. Columbus actually has a game in hand, too. So if you extrapolate out the point total, it was sitting at about 45. Now it's about 47 that you might need to make it. And Toronto's a rocket ship. Cincinnati's playing pretty well. Yeah. So even if, let's, let's, if, even if you set aside New England and Charlotte, who I think we'd agree are kind of mediocre soccer teams. Like, they yeah. might sneak in, yeah. but they're just... They're yeah. not that good. Cincinnati and Toronto are definitely better than the fire right now, and that would mean you'd have to have, at a minimum, you'd have to jump Columbus, who, you know, battered the fire last time they met, Cincinnati and Toronto. And You're talking about the math 16 just not- points at a minimum, I think. So two points per game because there's eight games left. Do, you, do we think the fire are capable of a two-point-per-game run for the – maybe for a short stretch – like we saw in, in the five-game unbeaten stretch, maybe for a little bit. But you have to actually want it. Yeah, also, Jairo Torres has now started four games in a row after that was Brian Gutierrez's spot. We've been confused the last two games how he's kept it. Nope, it's good. It should be Goody's got to go back in it's for the Montreal be. game. Or unless things change wholesale, because maybe at some point Ezra Hendrickson's like, screw it. Yeah. We just need to score some goals. Yeah, Because this is the other thing, and this is a good segue, I think, to goal number two. I'm going to draw a comparison here, Pat, between... This goal, where the ball is given away by Shehos, who might have been fouled on the penalty spot, yeah. and NYC tap it in. I'm going to compare this to the game Chelsea played against Tottenham Hotspur in the Premier League a couple weeks ago. Chelsea were understandably mad yeah. because there was a clear foul in the build-up to Tottenham's first goal that was not called, and then the second goal should not have stood either because right. a player's hair was pulled, should have been a red card and a free kick, and the goal should have been chalked off. However, that can be true. And you can still have to defend. Yes. The fire should not be in a position where a center back is isolated with his back to the rest of the field on the ball getting pressured in his own area. You cannot end up there. And because once you're there, even if he gets the pass off, you're still in trouble. Right. So, the fa- so a couple of things. One, the fire played themselves into trouble there. This is maybe Gaga's only one slight error on the day is... That's not the pass you play there. That just cannot be the pass you play there to your center back all alone three feet in front of you. But also, I'm also kind of a fan of there should be kind of a high bar for the clear and obvious distinction overturning goals. I think, you know, and we don't need to get into this. I've said as much on Twitter. I think Major League Soccer is weirdly like the only soccer league on earth that has VAR vaguely right. Yeah, um, for so the most I, part. I think what that is, this is is... She host kind of trips over his own feet in the process of getting fouled. I don't know if that's what they see there. They allow the goal to stand, but man, so, yeah, I, I talked to Shehus after the game about it. He was a lot more um, took a lot more ownership and responsibility than 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 Shaq did. He's like, I didn't see the guy pressuring from the left, which I think was Pereira again. Um, he he's like, I thought we were out of that situation. We were right back in it. I didn't see Pereira coming from the left. Um, he's like he said. I don't even know if I was touched. He didn't want to even argue that he was fouled. And there's the he ownership you want to see yeah, from Shakiri. He put it on himself. Yeah, she was just saying I didn't check my left shoulder. Yeah, that's on me. Right, and, and that's kind of my point. What happens after that? Does he get fouled? Yeah, maybe he does. But Shios is identifying that that could have been entirely avoided. Yeah. And then the really, and this kind of goes back to the Gaga passion thing. So Shios turns the ball over, and NYCFC is basically two on zero there. They're going to score. But everyone stands and watches. No one moves. Gaga is out there flailing, trying his best to just get in the way, and everyone else is just watching. So then after that, uh, Carlos Tehran, unsurprisingly, goes down with a hamstring. Because he was not ready to start this game. He he had been in training, but um, it did feel like he came back sooner than, than they thought he would, and it felt like that could happen. Um, we wondered if, if Ezra would bring in Kendall Burks, but instead he brought in Guti, and they went to a three-five-two with Guti and Mueller playing wingbacks. So it's a formation we have not seen. I don't know how often they've trained it at all. This just they felt looked, like a desperate, we're just going to throw people they, on the field. They looked very uncomfortable. You had Fabian Herbers basically navigating traffic in the middle, pointing to, like, to the spaces that everybody should be going. It looked better as they played it. 
a little bit. Um, they created the chance that was it was Duran, right, that hit the underside of the bar, I believe. Duran hits, has a header off the crossbar in stoppage time. And also relevant to any complaints the fire might have about the Shehos foul or anything else, it doesn't matter if you don't put a single shot on target in 90 minutes. Yeah. It, you, you can't complain about anything else if you do not even put a single attempt and, on frame. And Ezra was, I, I, you know, I've been on the record as saying I like Ezra a lot. And it, it, after the game, you know, I think Brian Sandalow asked him first question. It was like, how? Basically, how did that happen? And Ezra's like, I wish I had a good answer for you, but I don't. Um, basically, he, he talked for a minute, but the, the, the long story short is he's like, we came out unprepared and we didn't want it. And ultimately, that's on me because it's my job to have them prepared. And I, I, I appreciate... Obviously, because I'm getting on Shaq for not doing it, and I praise Shuhus for doing it. I appreciate when guys take ownership and responsibility of their role and how they could have they could have been better. Because ultimately, it is a bunch of people failing at once, and they need to ask themselves how they can do better. But um, I don't know that it was on Ezra. I mean, maybe you could argue that the the substitution pattern was weird when Bobby came in, Pineda came out, but he had answers for all of that. And at least you're going, okay, that's what he was thinking. I don't, Shaq didn't have an answer for why he didn't run. So I, I it's, yeah, and we're, and we're not there day to day. We don't know what the yeah. what the mood is. It, you do. I think there has to be some question of Ezra asked based on the way the team starts that game. I think once the game is going, then it heavily falls think, on the players to react. Yeah. The fact though that the fire yeah. walked out there from minute one and just were so flat. I know Ezra wouldn't disagree with that. I know he wouldn't, and it, like he, he's, you know, he's that, that, probably looking at. That's really my question yeah. because again, we can we can watch that game and we can explain and understand what happens in between the lines in the ninety minutes. We can we can put together those pieces. The fact that there was just no urgency, maybe that is all on the players, which then asks the just the esoteric question at this point of the Chicago Fire is, how do you change everything? And this team just looks the same. We're going to talk, I think, more after a break about Bridgeview. I think we're going to talk about it more in this podcast. But they just reverted back. I mean, that game looked like 2018. It looked like yeah. 2019. Just so much apathy. And Right. And I, I'm going to uh, continue to fan flames because, you know, why not? Um, were they missing Gaston in that game? And I'm a guy who's argued that Pineda is – maybe even a better option than Gaston at times and that like but you know I I kind of I, I think Ezra said after that they, they were missing Gaston and from a long ball passing standpoint I do see that that's the, I do this see is that. the type of game you want Gaston Jimenez in you want Gaston playing any game where the team is going to play a low block because if they're going to just give you the ball and say beat us Gaston is one of the better passers on this team. Yeah. He's not great at other, th- other things. We've covered his weaknesses on this show. This is a game where they missed Gaston Jimenez mightily. Uh, he was in the crowd just behind the south goal with his young son, you know, watching the game. I mean, we don't, son's cute. We don't yeah. have an official diagnosis yet, but I will not be surprised if we don't see Gaston again this year. So, I, yeah, we did not get a chance to ask Ezra that because we were limited to four questions, and I think that's only because they weren't trying to – it wasn't anything they were covering up. It was that Ezra was answering our questions with very, very, very long answers, and the PR team wanted to get us to the locker room before everybody left. So Understandably, because if was, I was a player, I would want to just get All out. very understandable, and, and unlike the Columbus game, a lot of guys did stick around, um, so I'll give them credit for that. But um, – but yeah, we didn't get to ask Gast- or we didn't get to ask Ezra about Gaston's status. Uh, we did ask the PR team; they weren't sure. Um, we won't know till Wednesday. Now is when uh, we're scheduled to talk to Ezra at the usual weekly Zoom that we do. So tomorrow, um, I'm getting my days mixed up at this point. It's all running together at this point, Alex. Um, but yeah, tomorrow we talk to Ezra. So hopefully, we'll have an answer. I'll throw it up on Twitter, and and I'll probably write something up for the website as well. But um, we need to know about uh, Gaston. We need to know about Carlos Tehran at this point again. We need to know about. Um, Casper Shabilko and just how he's Yeah, we doing. haven't really mentioned that. Yeah. The the other thing, so I kind of mentioned this with regard to Jairo Torres with Shakiri. Shakiri not running is okay if you have everybody else, if you have players who are doing his running for because him. Because he can play such beautiful, yeah. Right. The yeah. problem, though, is you got Jairo Torres does not run. Casper Shabilko, after that one magnificent game, once again looks like he can't run. And 
you notice the difference when Duran is in there and said it's I, it's it's almost it's over the top comical how because I it is. if because this is the thing it's if Shakiri's not going to run which it seems like he's not going to you almost need to have Gutierrez and Duran in those positions along with Mueller because those guys will all do the running it's just the team is lopsided right now and there's no outs of this right now the rest of the season at least the fire got to figure out how to play within their limitations and I think maybe that's the question you ask of Ezra is at some you know have you know I, I'm we know exactly we know what you'd like this team to do but at some point you have to accept what players are rather than what they are not is there a better formation and is, it a, is there a better formation that they is have the personnel to run? Is there a better formation when the fire are fully fit? I think it's an interesting question because I, I think there could be an interesting back three scenario where you play Shihos, Pineda, Tehran as a back three. Mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. And then that kind of allows... Then you play Jimenez and Navarro in front of that. Somebody's coming out, though, then. A Sekulich feels like the odd man out there, but again, you don't really have a well-suited right wing back unless you kind of do a lopsided thing where you have Navarro play left wing back and Mueller play right wing back, but kind of only play wing back out of possession and not in it. Right. I, I, I don't know. Again, the fire, you basically need to maintain a formation with that free 10 roll because it's really all Shakiri does at this point. Mm -hmm. I know the, the fire are, you I think what Ezra's trying to do is get his best players on the field. But just throw currently getting the best players on the field does not lead to a tactical setup that is cohesive and works. Right now, you simply, I guess my overall theme is you currently cannot play Jairo Torres, Jordan Shakiri, and Casper Shabilko all together. You just, that ship has sailed. So the question is, what do you do now? What we're going to do now, though, is I think pay some bills. <laughs> Let's do it, Alex. Uh, Points Bet Sportsbook is counting down the days until the football season with a new offer every day until the season kicks off. These are actually pretty fun. I'm getting them in the email every day. Uh, if you're you know, a Points Bet member, you'll get those too. And they're actually, there's some pretty fun stuff on there. Um, from now until September 8th, Points Bet Power Hour will unlock a new daily offer from 12 to 1 uh, Central Standard Time. Uh, very soon coming up then. Sign up for points bet now using code CHGO to also get risk-free bets up to $2,000. Don't miss out on your chance to get daily access to free bets, boosted odds, and so much more now through September 8th. But that's not it. If you make a $51 or more first-time deposit, you'll receive a free CHGO membership, which unlocks all of our web content. And you'll even get a free shirt of your choice from the CHGO locker. We should point out, there's some of those on sale right now. Go check that out. Download the PointsBet app today and use code CHGO to take advantage of this limited time offer. Don't just bet. Live your bet life with PointsBet. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-GAMBLER for crisis counseling and referral services. And I have to tell you, as usual, about OWN, which stands for only what you need. O-W-Y-N. OWN is a 100% plant-based protein shake that gives you nutrition that works as hard as you do. All of their products are free of artificial ingredients, and they're allergen-friendly, including being gluten and dairy-free. I'm a big fan of that personally. And I first heard about Owen from Chicago Bears quarterback Justin Fields, who himself follows a plant-based diet. And Owen and CHGO have partnered up to give you an awesome offer, 20% off your first purchase at liveowen.com. we got a lot of sales in and around CHGO at the moment, so be sure to take advantage of all these offers. For Owen, you can use the code CHGO20, that's CHGO20. So join me and Justin Fields and try Owen, only what you need. So, Pat, we basically said we don't think the Fire are going to make the playoffs at this point. They are not technically dead yet. No. 16% chance, according to 538. That basically requires them to win most of their remaining games, and that starts this weekend. Guess who's back this weekend? That starts with Georgi Mihailovic's yes. Montreal Club de Foot, who come to Soldier Field this weekend. Georgie currently in the midst of a bit of a transfer battle. Yeah. Azed Alkmaar want him now. Montreal want to send him yeah, it, later. It looks like, and, he, it, and Georgie may even, for you know, wanting to make sure he's playing before the World Cup and increasing his chances that Greg will take him, 
Um, he may actually even want to stay in Montreal at this point, but I, I, obviously he'll, long-term he'll want the transfer to Azed. Um, it seems like the latest is because I don't think he can be transferred now and loaned back like the Gaga thing because of the, the window closing. I think it would just be a end-of-season transfer, but then he finishes the season in Montreal, which looks like the most likely thing, which means he will, although he didn't play last weekend, we're thinking he will play this weekend at Soldier Field. And you know, in his last crack against the fire, he's going to want to put up some numbers. He is. Yeah, it's a bit of a weird situation because, to your point, the reason Gaga was able to be loaned back is because the MLS window right. was still open. Ozzet could sign him right now. The European window is open. But because the MLS window was shut, he then cannot yeah. be loaned Back. So it's a bit of a, it's not a, it's not an allocation order concern like the fire are currently yeah. facing with Gaga. It's a, they would not be allowed to bring him back in. So yeah, to your point, the latest reporting is they're going to agree a fee and then everyone's just going to wait. And good news for the fire on that. They will get 10% of the sale, which is rumored to be around 6 million. So that's, and they can convert all of it to gam if they want to, I believe. So all of it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I mean, th- that's good financial deal for the fire. If you remember the base fee, was, I believe, 900000 in game for Georgie. We have reason to believe he has hit some of the add-ons. I mean, based on the way he's played, the ad- if the add-ons were even remotely realistic, he's hit them. It's- so you're looking at a total transfer value somewhere in the region of $1.6, $1.7 in GAM coming into the fire over, the- over a couple of seasons for Georgie Mihailovic, which, when all is said and done, not bad. If you're a fan of the fire, you obviously want the fire to win because they still have a chance. If you have given up on the fire and you're a fan of watching things burn, a Georgie hat trick to beat the fire at Soldier Field or something absurd like that, I'm not saying it would be entertaining, but from a storyline standpoint, it would be very interesting. He's going to be motivated, especially, I mean, the combination of the homecoming, the transfer, the... You know, if he wants to really show Montreal fans, hey, I didn't want to leave yet. I wanted to stay here and help us fight for a championship. Because it's what he's doing. Montreal, quietly, they're like not one of the more interesting teams in MLS. They they were at one point playing some really interesting, fun soccer. And now we're just kind of plodding along. But they're still in second place. Yeah, Georgie's a big part of that. They're fighting for silverware. They missed out on the Canadian championship this year. They didn't even make it to the final of that. So, you know, they're they're looking... Yeah, they're looking for a Champions League spot. They're looking for an MLS Cup run. Georgie's going to be really motivated this weekend. As we mentioned, it is back at the, you know, if you thought that the Seat Geek surface wasn't great the other day, it was, I don't know why they watered it before the game and at halftime. We'd gotten a ton of rain, and the cleats chewed that thing up like it was a golf course. I mean, it just, it looked, the field yeah, was... Yeah, I mean, it was better than Soldier Field. Better but. than Soldier Field, but it was pretty cut up by the end of the game. We know that Soldier Field is basically impossible to play soccer on these days. Between that, it was a mediocre surface already. The Bears have been there. Uh, Bad Bunny was there the other night, yeah. so that's not going to help. Uh, we'll see, I guess. It is the uh, there's only two games left at Soldier Field. This one and then Charlotte will be at Soldier Field. The rest are at SeatGeek. So uh, of the remaining home games, Montre- so. uh, sorry, Miami and New, New England, England are at SeatGeek. Yeah, it is the also the giveaway. Uh, This weekend is the replica of the old Soldier Field. Um, It's actually kind of sweet. So it's the old uh, layout, the 1998, they're calling it layout because that's when they won MLS Cup of of Soldier Field. So um, if you go this weekend, you get the mini mini Soldier Field, the first 5,000 do. So that's actually, I think, the coolest giveaway of the year. This was the giveaway this week, this this flag. This was given away to the first... uh, 10,000 fans, I think, at SeatGeek this weekend. And total attendance was, what, 11,800? Something in in that range. It was, um, you know, the crowd was nice. Credit to all of the staff around the fire, whoever the people in charge of putting up all the banners were. Was that the most red we've, like, ever seen at SeatGeek in terms of, like, nice, de- yeah. decoration? Even when the fire was still wearing red, I don't remember there being that much of it. In terms of the surroundings. Hang on, Lawrence. I'm going to send you the mini soldier field right now. So you Thank can you. Put it up. I, you know, if I was prepared, I would have had that ready to go. But uh, no, that's all because good. Because this is a bit of a shorter segment here, Pat, do we want, is this the time to talk about the overall Bridgeview experience? I believe this was the first game of the season that you and I were both at in person, other than the doubleheader. 
Um, yes. So, um, I guess I'll start. Clearly, um, Bridgeview was staffing this game like it was a, a Red Stars game. In the fire chat, Lawrence. Check it out. Yeah. Um, getting into the parking lot was kind of a nightmare. There was one way in and one way out, basically. Yeah. I, so, I, I got there early because I was media, so I didn't have this issue. I parked on the, on the west side, but... You weren't the only one complaining about the uh, the parking lots. And part of the problem is that the academy's got, what, four or five new fields there. So it ate up a big chunk of what was the north lot. So Well, the other problem was a very 21st century one, which is, and the fire publicized this, you either had to buy a parking pass in advance or pay or cash, cash on site. Yeah. And what happened, inevitably, is <laughs> most people didn't buy in advance and no one carries cash in 2022. So you had a whole <laughs> bunch of people trying to download an app in their car. It was kind of a mess. That's not security's fault. It's not the fire's fault. But it was just kind of an, an interesting example. But, you know, my, my biggest thought, Pat, is not to, um, it's not to quote Patrick Starr here, but why can't we just take SeatGeek Stadium and push it somewhere else? I want TQL Stadium well, yeah, by I mean, the United Center. We That's all, what I want. We all That's want, what I want that. But, yeah. like, if you could just take SeatGeek and move it into the city somewhere because it's, it's the right size for what the fire currently are. If you modernized it a little bit and, like, you know. And close the press box that, so when the, when the weather isn't perfect, it's although not I liked, awful. Although I like that breeze this weekend. No, no. This weekend yeah. it was a good outdoor press box weekend. For those of you who do not know, SeatGeek Stadium was largely designed off of Dignity Health Sports Park in Los Angeles. No one realized until they had built a place that having an outdoor press box works in L.A., doesn't work so well in Chicago. A lot of the times, but yeah. yeah, there, there it is. There's the mini soldier field. Is that not sweet? That's a great giveaway, even down to the weirdly colored seats they had at Old Soldier Field. So this was supposed to be, I believe, the last game of the year. This was going to be the 10-9 uh, New England Revolution giveaway, but when that one got bumped to SeatGeek, they had to move it up uh, to a game that was actually at Soldier Field because giving away a Soldier Field at SeatGeek Stadium would be really strange. It would be so, really on brand though yeah. for the current state of the team. Just, just the, that. Just what are we? Yeah. <laughs> so but no, yeah. I, I liked it. it uh, you know, the sight lines for soccer are better in They're Bridgeview. Better, yeah. The fan energy was really solid. Yeah, a lot yeah. of, a lot of young fans, a lot of kids at this game. Um, yeah, it just. And, I don't mind it. I like being there. As I've said before, it's closer to home for me. I know it isn't for most people. Um, there's things that I like better. Like Soldier Field has a, you know, a big stage feel to it, but it's harder to see. The acoustics are way better at yeah. Soldier Field. Sea Geek video needed, boards are obviously well. Sea Geek yeah. has needed a new video board for like seven years at yeah. this point. Credit though to the Fires like media team for still having graphics that they've made for those. You know, because the the standard size dimensions for anything, the ratio is sixteen by nine. Yep. The Soldier Field video boards are narrower top to bottom than yeah. that, and then the Sea Geek Stadium video board is a square. Yeah. So shout yep. out to whoever had to do all that work yeah. to make sure all the graphics there's, fit there's on the There's little stuff that, like, and I, I think about the ticketing people, too, and what they had to go through. There's little stuff that we don't think about that are big headaches for people at the club who are working very hard to try to make, you know, somebody had to design all those banners with wind trust on them, then all the red that in the ring of fire and everything they put up. Somebody had to do that. They, they put a lot of work and effort into it. The thing I would say that sucks is, and I've been to games as a fan twice this year, this game and the, uh, the doubleheader with the right. Red Stars. Both of those games, there was a lot of fans. It felt like a good atmosphere, and then the team just produced nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. And so I, I, what stinks is, you know, you get these people showing up, and you don't have to win, but just be entertaining. And those two games have been the least entertaining games the Fire have played this season. Yeah. It's, I, you know, uh, from an overall standpoint, though, I, I know it's weird to have to move home stadiums. It's, it's not the best, but I, I, I don't think in the big picture it's that big of a deal. It's, it's, a, it's an inconvenience, but it's not, you know, I, I said this before. I do think they'll, they'll get a soccer-specific stadium in the city, and it will be beautiful and amazing. And Eventually. Um, it's just a question of when. It's going to take a while, and we'll all look back and go, hey, remember when we had to – Go play games at SeatGeek because Soldier Field was messed up because of the concerts and the Bears. I don't think the turf at Soldier Field's ever going to be good. It's been like, no ever. because the so. city's never going to the park district is never going to spend the money because that's the thing. SeatGeek is a grass field that was grown and regrown. Let's regrown like every year on site. 
That's how soccer fields are supposed to work. And it's not supposed to be sod. Yeah. It's not supposed to be whatever cut of grass, whatever species of grass they're throwing down at Soldier Field. Because that's know. not it either. That's what so- That's how a soccer field is supposed to work. I'm no grass person. My yard is brown. But I live I know, in an apartment. I don't have a yard to take care of. So you know, also I, I know it's not, it's not fun to watch that surface at Soldier Field. And when the Bears are complaining about it, and, and Fabian Herbert said something funny on their podcast this week. Um why does a good surface really matter for American football? Like, they're falling down on it anyway and tearing it up anyway. I don't know. Like, hold, hold on. The goal of any sport is to be fast. Yeah. And you need I to mean, run if you're missing it. chunks, it could hurt somebody. Or But yeah. the Bears also were famous like, for intentionally yeah. growing the grass longer than yeah. the NFL yeah. wanted them and to. The Bears years. are still famous for living in the frickin' past and yes. still doing that, but they have but a like, quarterback and, who and needs soccer to run. has to roll, and it can't roll at Soldier Field. It, it, it bounces so. more at Soldier yeah, Field. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, we know this. It's real bad. No, but that, that, again, we said this last week, but that was what was so funny, was watching everyone on Twitter be like, oh my God, this field is off. It's like, tell me you don't watch the fire without telling me you don't watch the fire, because <laughs> we've known it's bad. Yeah. Welcome to the party. Yeah. It's terrible. Um, you know what's not terrible? Watching Leeds United play soccer. The, the Premier League in general. The Premier League is on oh. drugs right now. Uh, we were saying off air before the show that it's um, the current Premier League table looks like when you're like seven or eight seasons deep in a FIFA career mode sim, and it's just a total mess because like Liverpool and Manchester United are both in like the bottom five. The top four includes Leeds. Brighton and Fulham behind Arsenal hey, at the top. Who's in first? Yeah, last? I was gonna say who. Arsenal who, look yeah. really good. Also, we're unfortunately never gonna hear the end of that William Saliba tequila song. I thought we, I thought it had run its do, course do, and then do, he do, scored. Do, do, do. Like do, I was do, like, do, it was do, it's do. like okay, they're finally petering out. They've uh, finally gotten tired of it, and then he uh, scored. It's like God damn it, do, 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 um, do. Saliba. So, there we go. Anyway, Arsenal are fun. Um, Leeds are ridiculous. Very Leeds, America. Leeds are fun. Brendan Aronson scores. Leeds are really fun. On yeah. the highest XG chance you will ever see. I believe the official rating was .96. And as someone pointed out, the only reason it's not one is because Eric Maxime Chupamoting, formerly of Stoke, now of Bayern, once missed a sitter literally where the ball was on the line not moving. And he kicked <laughs> it backwards. Right. And so yeah. that has permanently, literally, that has permanently thrown off the XG calculations because that happened once. So, Aronson scores. Tyler Adams is everywhere. Looks awesome. Jesse Marsh is just having the time of his life. Love to see it. Somehow not tearing his pants. And anyway, the reason we're talking about this, points bet pick of the week this week. Speaking of teams that don't belong in the top four of the Premier League, Leeds are playing Brighton. And those teams are fun. They both play high-octane soccer. Brighton coming off a 2-0 win over West Ham. Uh, Points bet pick of the week. Brighton versus Leeds, over two and a half total goals. That's minus good. 125. We did not win the bet this past week. We got a little greedy. We went for minus three and a half Leeds versus Chelsea. Chelsea couldn't even manage a consolation goal at the end. Leeds didn't score a fourth because, like, they run so much that they were kind of done running yeah. once it got to 3 0. So we fell short of that. We, we're going to rein it in a bit, but minus 125. For Brighton leads over two and a half. It feels like that's happening. I think it's right? going to be a fascinating game to watch. Should be a fun game. So that's your points bet pick of the week this week. Download the points bet app on your. You know, I, I'm still upset about the uh, the points bet power hour because yesterday was a United Liverpool yeah. free bet, and I looked at it and I'm like, well, I don't really. Th- you know, I, I assumed Liverpool would win because Man United stinks. That, so that I, I, right. I went away from that one, which fine, uh, and I went with the over three and a half goals because I looked at our last five matches and it's been four nil, four nil, five, two, four, two. Like I was like, okay, these teams score against each other. Let's get there. And no. Manchester United actually turned up and looked like a real soccer team. What a concept. What was that about? That's oh, weird. And when did Ronaldo came on in the 86th minute? Or yeah. Something? Cause he was part of a triple sub that was mostly just intended to give some fresh legs, kill some time. It's entertaining. Yeah. So it's, Oh, oh, who could have foreseen that United should have just played a front three of Marcus Rashford, Jaden Sancho, and Anthony Martial, which is what they were going to do last year before they signed Ronaldo simply because Man City tricked them into it by pretending <laughs> to be interested. Maybe the greatest thing Pep Guardiola's ever done. Anyway, um, let's talk about some happier news, Pat, and that is Americans, not only at Leeds, but lots of places in Europe. Had a weekend. Um, Josh Sargent started some weird sort of chain reaction by scoring two goals for Norwich on Friday, and then the goals just kept coming. 
all of the guys who are fringe guys for the nine spot on Burhalter's radar, and then some of the guys who probably aren't yet, like mm-hmm. Balagoon, all scored. Yeah, uh, guys, I believe, guys okay. with MLS ties. Guys, like it was weird. Got to. I'm gonna credit the scuffed podcast for this. They call it the hat. And that there's just a bunch of names in the hat at the nine position. And, like, most of the hat scored this weekend. So, you had Sargent <laughs> scoring two goals. Jordan Pifak looks right at home. I would take him for right For Union now. Berlin. Yeah. Right now, No, if, if the World Cup is tomorrow, the strikers are Ferreira, Sargent, and Pifak. I think Henry Bushnell of Yahoo Sports, also a former Chicagoan, um, said that and that his point was further backed up as the weekend moved along. So Pifak looks right at home for a very fun Union Berlin sign. He is replacing uh, Tayo Owenyi. It's also British commentators. Learn to say that name. Who now is at Nottingham Forest? Haji Wright out yep. in Turkey. Two goals yep. and an assist. Now I don't think people have realized that like the Turkish league is terrible. Now it's like the twentieth ranked league in Europe because of how bad their teams do in European competition. But goals are goals, so he is hanging around. We mentioned Aronson. Um, speaking of MLS ties, Miguel Almiron scored for Newcastle yep. against Man City. He's suddenly like a really important part of that team. He might get replaced if they bring in another attacker, Christian Pulisic, one of the names they've been linked to, although it appears he's staying at Chelsea. Jack Harrison, uh, honorary American Jack Harrison. Former fire draft pick. Former fire draft pick Jack Harrison. Then traded to NYCFC Jack Harrison uh, for Brandon Vincent. Rip. Uh, to his career, which ended yeah. at age like 24. He scored, and then, yeah, you mentioned Florian Balogun, who is not technically an American player yet. He's on loan from Arsenal at, I'm going to get this wrong because no one knows how to say either of these teams. Is it Rhymes? Rhymes? How do you say that team? I don't think I can hit the vowels on that. Because the pro- the problem is you have St- Stad Wren, yeah. and then you have Rems, or however you say it, yeah. who are two separate teams who American soccer fans frequently combine into one team. R-E-I-M-S. It's like the French version of Ghent and Genk. It's the worst. Mark McKenzie plays for the one with the K in it. I've learned <laughs> that at some point. Um, Balogun, three goals in three games in, uh, in Ligue 1. Currently tied at the top of the scoring charts with a few guys from PSG, who you might have heard of, who might not lose a game this year. They, Holy they, hell, they look good. That eight-second goal was insane. That was beautiful. Kylian Mbappe is fast. Uh, meanwhile, if we talk about American midfielders, Weston McKenney is apparently staying at Juventus. He's also started their first two games of the season, so that's promising. Speaking of starting games, Yunus Musa is now actually playing as a central midfielder for Valencia, so that's very nice. Greg's got problems. Good ones. Good problems to have, yeah. although if Tim Weah stays hurt and Giovanni Reina can't run, he has less problems in terms of picking a Fair. starting 11. Um, Tyler Adams, as we mentioned, looked very yeah. good for Leeds. Um on less happy notes, but still American-related, uh, Serginio Dest doesn't play for Barcelona anymore, but is still a Barcelona player. Would be nice to see him get a transfer, but he seems chill just living in Barcelona. But it'd be real great, Serge, if you could play some soccer between now and November 23rd. That would be neat. Um, Christian Pulisic is not going anywhere. Yeah. Reportedly for better or likely worse. Before we came on air, I saw a great video on Twitter, and it's Brendan Aronson scores. And while all the rest of the Chelsea players are kind of sulking, Pulisic is sticking his head out and watching down the touchline as Adams and Aronson are celebrating and Jesse Marsh is going nuts. I want to know what Pulisic, Adams, and Aronson talked about at full time because they were just kind of chatting in the middle of the pitch. The the frustrating thing to me is that, you know, and this will segue into a question for you, but that Pulisic is obviously good enough that he would start somewhere every week. Most places. And and he's just at a club that just plays a system that just... His position doesn't yeah. exist, and the manager doesn't think he's that good. Right, and he's had to play for this guy twice now, which is, is enormous. Yeah, well, that was the other thing. When people are like, oh, he knows him from Dortmund, it's like, do we remember why Pulisic wanted to leave Dortmund right. in the first place? Right. It's because right. he went from an every-game starter to a right wing back under Tuchel at Dortmund, and so he was like, get me out of here. Who and here is, we are again. Here's my question for you. Who is the men's national team's best player? Like, I ask you this question right now on the 23rd of August. Like, do you mean... Is, you're going to give me any context for that or just leave it totally open-ended? Open-ended. 
he is. I don't think he is the most important player to what they do, but I still think Christian Pulisic is the best Probably player. Probably still, right? He is still the guy who can do things with the ball that no one else on the national team can do. Giovanni Reina is probably going to be the best player on the team eventually. I think he's got the highest ceiling. I think Yunus Musa does some really impressive things. I think Tyler Adams is vital to how they play. But Pulisic is the guy. He is still the guy. And the national team needs him healthy. Like That's the floor. The floor is we need him healthy. Because he's sure. going to still, even if he doesn't yeah. play another minute for Chelsea, if he's healthy, he's starting in Qatar. But the national team needs a Christian Pulisic in form. Right. Like, how far we go at a tournament like the World Cup is dictated a bit, I think, by his ability to be a game-breaker. I think that the, the fact that you hesitated to answer Pulisic show something though because yeah. you wouldn't have a year ago it would have been obvious to everybody and now it's a it's it's a, it's Pulisic not playing coupled with guys like Aronson and Adams and Weston and playing and, and dominating in their in their for their teams so um I, I don't uh by the way on our on our number nine in the hat from the scuff podcast uh Vasquez is still Making a Vasquez is still floating around. Case. I think he's going to get a call up. Um, I don't think you call Ricardo Pepe anymore at this point. No, it just you got to let him figure things out. But we talked about Shakiri um, earlier about you know how you need people to do the running for him. Pulisic will press and can press like he's capable of it. But man, would it be great if you had Josh Sargent in form and Brendan Aronson both starting just to just bother yeah. the hell out of everyone the U.S. played, and then the space that would open for players like Pulisic like Musa, like McKenney, behind that. Um, I think it's going to be interesting because I think, I think the thing is because this team is so young and they've all come up together, I think everyone in that team still realizes that Pulisic is that guy. Yeah. Like, I, I yeah. think he still has that status. And I think the, the biggest thing that's developed over the last year is his self-awareness of it all. He, you know, he's not ever been a guy who said a lot, but he talked very openly about how he had some pretty difficult mental health struggles over the past couple of years, and he's been working through that, how the weight of expectation that he felt playing for the national team really did not that, help that. And that he, Volkswagen commercial that, and yet he is, is fantastic. He is fine. It seems like he is in a much better place of, okay, yeah, I know I'm this guy, but I also know I've got some help. I know yeah. that I can talk about it. Yeah, the Volkswagen commercial where he's literally on the, the couch in the psychologist office yeah. – and he said, and the question is, where is the pressure coming from? And he says, everywhere. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the tension in the air is cut by none other than Roy Kent randomly being there for some strange reason. No, I think Pulisic's in a really good headspace right now. I just really wish, and I think he wishes he could play some soccer. I think he wish he could go play for Jesse Marsh at Leeds. How fun would that be? No, and I am going to offend Wales here because we're playing them in the opening game of the World Cup. Imagine if you replaced Dan James with Christian Pulisic. In that Leeds team, it'd be so much fun. Yeah. Somebody take Pulisic on loan. I know it's not going to happen because Chelsea just don't have enough attackers right now. But, yeah, I guess this has been kind of a diatribe on American soccer. A lot is fun right now, and our best player isn't part of it. And his – I thought I saw this stat the other day. His XG per 90 is still very high. It's still better than Kai Havertz. Yeah. The, the fact that Tuchel just doesn't rate him is is – I don't know. Maybe there's something we don't know, but... I'd like to see him elsewhere. It doesn't look like it's going to happen. I wanted to see him at Juventus with Weston. Juventus could use some more wing depth. They're currently playing uh, very past it on Hal Di Maria. Not totally past, past his best. He's not past it, but he is not PSG Di Maria anymore. Um, Juventus could use some help there. There's a lot of teams that could use his services. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a time of anticipation on the national team as we build up the tension ahead of the World Cup. And it's just a time of an all-too-familiar disappointment for the fire. And so maybe they answer to the moment this weekend against Montreal. Or maybe fire fans find themselves cheering on Georgi Mihailovic. Uh, we'll see. It depends on how the game goes. But you'd like to think the fire would come out with a little bit more than they did this last weekend, though. Chicago Fire versus Montreal Club de Foot. 7 p.m. Saturday. Soldier Field. Um, elsewhere, should also shout out in the CHGO world, uh, the Chicago Sky played tonight yeah, in an elimination sky. game 
at Barclays Center in Brooklyn in New York against the New York Liberty. Must win to continue their national national champ. Wow. Their championship defense. So follow all of the CHGO Sky stuff. Lawrence has the shirt going. Um, Red Stars still in the playoff chase. Although there's there's some fireish vibes going on over there that that team just might be running on fumes. Yeah, they're still hanging in there. Let me check real quick what they are up to this weekend because I forget. Not great. They yeah. are playing Louisville this weekend. It is the easiest game they've got left on the schedule. They've got some really tough games after that. So they like the fire. They need to win. They got to win this weekend. They got to beat Louisville. They basically have no choice. Um, meanwhile, the the White Sox show is trying to stay light. Um, <laughs> Sean Anderson currently lighter uh, because he has less hair than he did yesterday. So they are trying to maintain optimism through it all. CHGO Cubs struggling a little bit more to do that. But I think I think they kind of accepted the state of things. The, the White Sox still a, want to feel like they have something to believe yeah, in. Yeah, it's a tough week for Cody Del Mendo, who's watching Albert Pujols hit homers at Wrigley Field. I want to see Albert get to 700 by the end of the year. because How much steroids yeah. is he currently on? Like, Because he has hit like 700 homers in the last week. As New rule, if you're over the age of 40, you get to take roids. I mean, my goodness. His plan is definitely working right now. <laughs> Not that I'm saying that, but also. Don't, don't make that man come back next year. Like, Ugh. this is all he wants. He needs, like, what, like six more by the end of the year, I think? Seven. He's now at 693. So, yeah, just get him a 700. Get him what he needs and send him on his way. Yes. Yeah, get him that Owen sponsorship. Maybe Athletic Greens. I don't know. Just. Get him, get him that extra few, illegal or otherwise. He is uh, one of the few pro athletes that's still older than me i believe he's two days older than me so i just kind of want him to hang on just like i want brady to hang on for that reason like it just makes me feel a little younger also a final shout out before we go uh shout out to former chgo fire guest co-host alex calabrese who starts college this week and we're all old go get him alex he's off to upstate new york to pursue his college education we wish him the best he was his last in-person fire game the time yes. being this weekend he'll be back i i i expect we might do a little world cup thing around here and yeah uh, we don't exactly know what we're doing that i want to i want to yeah. drag in some non chgo soccer people on on some world cup content we'll cross that bridge when we come to it but it's been a weird show it's been a sad show at times it's been a happy show at times we've been all over the place but you know when the fire end up in the same place they seemingly always do we, we got to look for silver linings elsewhere it sometimes. Is is. So that's going to do it for this episode of CHGO Fire. For Lawrence, behind the scenes. For Pat, I'm Alex. Fire vs. Montreal this weekend. The Georgie Show. It's going to be something. And we'll talk about it next week. Have a good one. Adios.